Howdy everybody, this is John Michael. Do you ever wonder how to bring the monastic principles into your lay life in the city? We're gonna be looking today at urban monasticism with a series on monk dynasty, all things are possible with God. Come back and join us. See you there. Welcome back, everybody. This is John Michael, and we're continuing on our Monk Dynasty series. No, not Duck Dynasty. We're doing Monk Dynasty. Monk Dynasty. <laughs> and we're going to be looking at urban monasticism today. See, most of the world's population, uh, differently than what it was 100 years ago, most people live in the city. How do we bring the beauty of monastic life into the city, into the city, into where we live? So that's the challenge. And we have some great examples. Today we're going to be looking at two great church fathers, St. Basil of Caesarea and St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Basil is from the Christian East. St. Augustine is from upper or northern Africa in the Christian West. So these are the two guys we're going to be looking at. Well, you know, first of all, let's take a look at Scripture. What's the scriptural basis of being in the city. Well, John 17, verses 15 and 16 says, Jesus graced priestly prayer. He says, I do not ask you, God the Father, to take them out of the world, but to, that you keep them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. This brings us to that language, that terminology that we hear so often. Christians are to be in the world, but not of the world. Well, what is worldly? 1 John chapter 2, 16 and 17 tells us what these things are. For all that is in the world, sensual lust, enticement for the eyes, a pretentious life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Yet the world and its enticement are passing away. Wow. So that kind of tells you, you know, we're to be in the modern world in the city. St. Basil gives us a great little uh, teaching on how to do this, and there's some powerful lessons from St. Basil. I, I, I love what he symbolizes for us today. St. Basil lived in 320 through 379 AD, and he comes from a Christian family. Uh, he also received Christian schooling. He was very well educated. He came from a Christian family that was uh, wealthy, and uh, they, they were a great family. So they sent him to the best of schools, and he got a good education. But he tended to fall away from the Christianity of his mother and of his family, and he tended to live kind of a secular life. He goes through a conversion, and when he goes through that adult conversion, what about you and me? Many of us are raised Catholic, we're raised Christian by our parents, but there comes a time in everyone's life where they have to make the faith of their family their own and to do it personally. It's not enough just to rely upon the faith of our mom or our dad or our brothers or our sisters. We have to have that personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That happened with St. Basil. When that happened with St. Basil, he goes out and associates with a group of hermits. He gets some training and they show him, here's how you really get, see we want to be radical but not fanatical. Radical. It comes from, from a word that means rooted, like a radish, deep in the earth. The deeper you're rooted, the higher your branches can extend. Fanaticism, it was called a sin in the Didache, fanaticism takes a certain external dimension of genuine radicalism, it, it kind of emphasizes it to an absurd and silly extreme, and it becomes a very dangerous thing. Religious fanaticism is a dangerous thing. So we want to be radical, but not fanatical. We want to have fundamentals, but we don't want to be fundamentalists. And so Basil had to learn how to do that. He had to learn how to do that. And he begins to live the hermit life on a family estate. The family estate is Inessi, and in Inessi it was some land that his family owned. 
he begins living this way of life, interestingly, with his family members. His brother is Peter, who's a hermit. His sister is St. Macrina. Macrina is, is venerated, and many sisters take the name Macrina today. That was the sister of St. Basil. Many would say she was the saint that really kept him on track. And so he, he lives out there with his sister and with his brother. His brother dies, and Macrina is kind of the, the elder of this monastic community. And it begins to really grow. He's, he's mentored by a guy named Eustathius. Eustathius, if you, if you read your monastic history, he's a guy that, that tended to take monasticism too far. There were all kinds of different forms of monasticism, all kinds of different forms on how to get radical, and sometimes they became a little fanatical. They began to do extreme things. Basil didn't like what he saw. He was a moderator, kind of by nature. He wanted to, to make uh, uh, radical Christianity doable and sane and constructive. He was very practical. So uh, he was mentored, but, and he loved his mentor. His mentor is very famous. He's actually the, really the founder of monasticism in that part of the world. But Basil doesn't go for the extremes. So he begins to moderate the way of life, and he begins to, uh, people begin to join them in Anessi. And Anessi, it's a fascinating place because it's out in the caves, out in the cliffs, but they build an expression of monasticism that is called the Basiliad. And when write, people write about it in church history, it's simply called the New City. Wow. That monastic valley, way out there, rugged, became a city. And Basil had in his mind, his idea was it would become a center for Christian education. Not sending Christian kids to secular schools for rhetoric and that kind of thing, classical uh, education, but to have a Christian base of education. They also built and began to function a, uh, or to operate a hospital. It's the first time that we see Christian hospitals. And the first time that anybody in that part of the world said, you know what? If Jesus says heal the sick, we got to take care of the sick. So we're going to have a hospital in our monastic city. They also begin to care for the poor. So they begin to take care of the underprivileged. And it was considered one of the wonders of the world in the time of St. Basil. Isn't that fascinating? So many of the things that we hold, as we take them for granted, you know, education, hospitals, care for the poor. We even look to the justice system, a fair justice system, where people are presumed innocent until proven guilty and there have to be witnesses. Much of this goes back to the Christian influence in civilization isn't it interesting that modern secular humanism now views Christianity as archaic and hateful and terrible, and yet it was Christianity that gave us these very basic things that we take for granted. And it was monasticism, and specifically going back to St. Basil, who brought us these things in a very practical way. He really emphasized the notion of uh, not the hermitage, but that the hermits had to live in a community. So they had time for solitude, but they did ministry. They did ministry. He wrote a rule called the asceticon, where we get the word asceticism, huh? Asceticon. And it was, it was not a monastic rule. He doesn't even talk much about monks. It was for Christians. How do we live following Jesus? And St. Basil is called the father of Eastern monasticism today. We also know him because of the liturgy of St. Basil. He was eventually ordained a priest and then made a bishop, and he wrote the liturgy. The liturgy of St. Basil is one of the fundamental liturgies of Christianity. From that came the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and many of the other Eastern liturgies, and those had a huge effect on what today we call uh, the Roman rite in the West. So he, he had a huge, huge influence on civilization, a huge input 
on monasticism. Uh, St. Benedict refers to him in his rule for monks in the West in the 6th century. And he has a great, great lesson for us. What about us? Are we, are we caring for the poor? Are we caring for the sick? Are we helping to educate folks? Are we doing all of our ministry, all of our activity from that base of prayer? All things are possible with God. Are we bringing the very basics of a good, humane civilization to our world today because of our life with Jesus? Jesus, fill us with this gift that you gave St. Basil. May we apply it in our world today. Come back. We're going to look at St. Augustine. All things are possible with God. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And my spirit Exalt in God my Savior For He has looked With mercy on my lowliness And my name will be forever exalted for the mighty God has done great things for me and his mercy will reach from age to age and holy 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 Howdy, everybody. This is John Michael. Welcome back. We are looking at urban monks, how to bring monasticism into the city and how that applies to us. We're going to be looking in this second section to St. Augustine. In the first section, we looked to St. Basil. We looked at the Basiliad and the new city and how he did so much ministry and had such a profound effect on, on Christianity, civilization, and on all future monasticism. This part, we're going to look at St. Augustine of Hippo, the great Western father of the church. So much of what we just take for granted comes from the theology and the writings of St. Augustine of Hippo, Bishop of Hippo. But we're not going to focus on that so much right now. We're going to focus on his monasticism, what it meant, and some of the, some of the conflicts that he had to deal with to put our conflicts in context. So St. Augustine lived from 354 to 430 AD, and 
we all know the story of his conversion, how he, he was basically a well-educated rascal. Again, he came from a, a good family, a wealthy family. Uh, he went and got great schooling, but uh, he was a womanizer, and he was a drunk, and he was all this stuff. As a matter of fact, history, we know that he had illegitimate children from his, from his pre-conversion days. So he was sowing his wild oats, and his poor old mama Monica, she would pray. She was a good Orthodox Christian. She would pray for the conversion of her son. And she prayed for a long time, no answer. Monica's prayers paid off. And finally, he begins to start coming back. He comes to an unorthodox expression of Christianity first, and he listens to the teachings of guys like St. Ambrose. He's you know, up in Italy, and he finally goes through conversion. Eventually, uh, he comes back to Orthodox Christianity, accepts the faith, and decides to live a monastic life. He was very, very impressed with St. Athanasius' life of St. Anthony of the Desert, who we looked at in an earlier program. So he begins to try to live this way of life himself, and he goes to the family estate in Tagaste, and he lives there with his mother, Monica, and with his illegitimate son, unnamed, but his illegitimate son. It's a family monastic experience. Again, remember, St. Basil did the same thing. It was a family monastic experience. Same thing with St. Augustine. So he goes to Tagaste, and he lives there, get, kind of figuring it out. Then he's ordained a presbyter, and event, well, the, the people of, of Hippo want to make him the bishop. So they ordain him a presbyter and then a bishop against his will, and he becomes the bishop of Hippo. Hippo is in northern Africa, in around Algiers. Uh, it's not that far across the Mediterranean, across to Italy and Cyprus, so it really is not in the eastern orbit of the Christian church. He's in the western orbit. So he becomes the bishop, and as he becomes the bishop, he applies monasticism to his situation as a bishop. And he does something extraordinary. He tells all of his presbyters, the word priest and presbyter are used interchangeably. He says, you guys, I want you to live a monastic life. And I want you to live a common life, a life in common. So we see so many priests out there on their own, and they get sucked into worldly things, and they fall into negative behavior, you know, drinking and womanizing, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we all know this happens. Priests are human. So he says, guys, I want you to live together, and I want you to support each other in living a truly, holy, on-fire life for Jesus Christ. So he begins to apply monasticism to the presbyters, to the, to the clergy, and he goes, gives them clergy training. They're basically uh, little seminary schools and, and monastic schools. They learn how to live together. They learn how to pray daily. They learn how to eat together and get along. They learn how to be obedient to a superior, not only in a general vague sense, but in a very real day-to-day -day sense. And it works. It works. What happens is this grows, and he begins sending clergy out all around that part of the world. And many of the bishops of the church in that part of the world come from this monastic clerical experience. Some of the things that he was fighting, you have to remember that when Augustine was made the bishop of Hippo, Christianity was not all that successful, not Orthodox Christianity. There were all kinds of heretical, the word heretic or heresy comes from the word division, so there were little groups and divisive expressions of Christianity. One was Manichaeans, not necessarily even a Christian group, but it had kind of came under the umbrella of Christianity, they believed in dualism. The spirit's good, the flesh is bad. And Augustine spent much of his time addressing Manichaeans and calling them back to a full Christian experience where flesh is, and creation, 
The world is good. It's created by God, and the Spirit is good. It's not the Spirit against the flesh and against the world. Both are good when they're integrated and Spirit has primacy. The other group that he had to fight were Donatists. Donatists comes from a word that basically means appears or seems. And Donatists believe that Jesus was so divine that his humanity got absorbed and only, he only seemed to be human. So St. Augustine addresses that, and he, and he wins. He calls him back to a, to a fully incarnational understanding of Jesus. Jesus, yes, he's fully divine, but he's fully human too. And the other group that he had to deal with that went the other extreme were the Arians. The Arians believed that Jesus was fully human and he was divine, but only kind of seemed to be divine. There were questions about, was that a full divinity? Did he pre-exist, et cetera, et cetera. So Augustine had to fight the Arians. And he won. And it worked. Again, calling people to an orthodox Christianity, fully incarnational, where Jesus is one hypostasis, one person with a divine and a human nature in the one person of Christ. And that's so powerful because we go back to, to the great teachings of the fathers. God became man so that man could become God, so that we can become sharers again in the divine nature. So Augustine does this. There's an orthodox revival and he writes a rule. The rule they think was first written to a group of sisters and then he applied it to the clerics. And it's a great, great, he, he, it's just so balanced how to live together in Jesus. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you also have to re have a relationship with each other. How cool is that? So we gotta be able to, if, if we're gonna reach up to God, we have to reach out to each other. And Augustine teaches us this wonderful gift. And he moderates, like St. Basil did, the extremes. Well, an interesting thing happened at the end of Augustine's life there begin to be invasions by the Vandals and the Goths. They begin to come down, uh, what we call barbarians, even though they weren't strictly speaking barbarians, but they begin to attack, not only up in Italy and in Europe, through, through part of the Middle East, they also come around to Northern Africa. And the church is in peril. They begin to burn churches close churches, persecute Christians. Then the reports begin coming in. They're persecuting, killing, torturing priests, bishops. Augustine holds out. He encourages those in persecution, and he dies, literally, weeks before the fall of Hippo. This has so much to teach us. We live in a world that has shifted from a Judeo-Christian moral base to a secular humanist base. We are seeing kind of a modern persecution of Christianity. Christianity is now the most persecuted religion on the face of the earth. Augustine teaches us, don't give up. Stay orthodox. Don't give in to these small groups. The monasticism of St. Augustine is a great sign of encouragement. He hung in there. You can too. And now we call him one of the greatest saints in the history of the church. You can be a saint too. All things are possible with God. Well, howdy folks. I hope you are enjoying these programs of All Things Are Possible With God. You know, we need to bring revival. America needs revival now. And we're trying to bring that through this program. This program is a wonderful way to bring the gospel of Jesus to people who are in their homes who often don't even get out because they can't or because they become disenchanted with the church. So we want to reach to folks where they are. You know, the Pope has said, I invite every Christian at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That is what all things are possible with God is all about. But well, we need you to help us. We need partners. You know, I don't keep 
any of the money that comes to my ministry or through the television program. I don't have a retirement plan, but everything that comes in, we plow right back into the Brothers and Sisters of Charity and into our ministry. Please help us to do this. Now, we also need you to go to my website, check it out. It's a wonderful website, all kinds of information about our ministry. Go to the Facebook page. I do a gospel reflection every day on that Facebook page, and I tell you about where I'm going to be doing ministries. We're going out to 60 parishes and churches all across America every year. I'm out there doing ministry. Join us in one of those ministries. We need you to help. You can make a one-time gift if you want. And if you can, please help us through a sustained giving program. That means giving every month to help keep this television program on the air. So help us to keep this going. All things are possible with God. I love you guys. Let's bring the whole world to revival in Jesus Christ. He is the Good Shepherd And He's laid down His life for His sheep So out of many nations He's gathered one fold in one faith And He has built His church On the rock foundation of faith On apostles and prophets Who shepherd the people in His place There is one faith one hope and one baptism, one God and Father of all. There is one church, one body, one life, and the Spirit now given so freely to all. And he gave to Simon Peter, through him, to all of the twelve. The keys of the kingdom, so darkness shall never prevail. But some of the shepherds have pastured themselves on their sheep. So he has come out against them and scattered the people of faith. But there still is one faith, one hope, and one baptism, one God and Father of all. There is one church. One body, one life, and the Spirit now given so freely to all. In good pasture, He will shepherd His people. On the mountain tops, He feeds His sheep. The poor and afflicted Through the wilderness He brings relief There is one faith, one hope And one baptism, one God And Father of all There is one church, one body, one life And the Spirit now given so free 